so there's the okay um Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, my name is Hamna Abdul Muttalib. I'm a medical intern. And today I will be taking the lecture, um, Gentile Urinary, Urinary Oncology. So it's a very simple, uh, concise topic. I know that there's a lot of slides that actually go into the PPT, but it's actually very simple. All you need to know are the key points of each one of them. And you, this lecture will take you maybe 20 minutes to recap max. Right. So the four topics that we're going to cover today are first, renal carcinoma. And then we'll go on to the bladder. And then we'll continue with the prostate. And then we'll go to the testes. Right. So these are the four oncology topics that we are going to be covering today. The approach will be very simple. We'll look at each one's origin, the classification, uh, the types we have, how do we investigate them, what are the clinical features, and what is the management. Right, so these will be interwining with each other. So once you know exactly these five points for all of these four, you can answer any exam question that comes about in your way. So the first one is renal tumors. When we talk about renal tumors, it's very important to understand that it's very rare to actually have benign tumors. So whenever we talk about an oncology or tumor, we know that we classify them into benign and malignant, right? So when we look at it in this classification, when it comes in terms of renal, most of them will be malignant. We have very, very few um, cancers that are uh, very few types that are actually benign. So as soon as you see symptoms of renal, you can already assume that it is malignant until proven otherwise. So you should immediately think of it as being a more um, aggressive form rather than something that you can wait on. Okay, so renal cell carcinomas arise from the proximal tubule cells. This is an MCQ question, right? So where does it, or where is the most common site of origin? They're from the proximal tubule cells. The male to female ratio is approximately two to one. So the stem or the scenario will usually have a male uh, patient presenting to you with groin or flank pain, etc. cetera. There is, with patients who are already um, diagnosed with one hip and syndrome, it's more common in them. The pathology, depending on the stage, remember this word very carefully, depending on the stage, the symptoms change, especially for renal carcinoma. Because when it's only with uh, the kidney, we have symptoms that are more like related to pain or like urinary symptoms or like stuff like that. But as it moves on to the vena cava, to the nodes, etc., etc., especially when it starts to go outside even the renal system itself to the lungs, etc., the symptoms will change as well uh, accordingly. So the pathology can go on to invading the renal vein, the inferior vena cava. It can also go up to the lungs. It can even metastasize, uh, meta uh, the metastasis can even go through till the brains. And in the lung, they have a very characteristic uh, uh, look, which is called as the cannonball image, right? What is a cannonball? I don't know if you're familiar with this, but during war, they used to have these in the olden generation, they used to have these uh, things that they would shoot out uh, fireballs. Those of you who play video games are more familiar with it. So they basically are tiny, 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 tiny. Well, in, in the war time, they were obviously very big, but when we look at them, they're small, small, round, 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 round um, images pictures actually so in the this image is not that clear but when you look at the uh, lungs this is a clear pathology of a met from the renal carcinoma this is very characteristic because in the uh, lung usually when we have some kind of uh, finding it's usually a consolidation or it will be near the hyla region or near one of the lobes etc when we see it throughout the lung especially in a very specific way, we know that this is one of the signs. So in an MCQ format, they can give you just this image and they can ask you to actually uh, come up with the diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma. 
The next thing is the symptoms. How does the patient present to you? This is very important for both solving the questions as well as recognizing the patient itself in real life. So it's a classic triad. Triad is anything that comes with three main symptoms. Okay, so we have hematuria, which is blood in the urine, right? Then we have loin pain, which is basically pain that extends. This is, if for example, this is somebody's back, uh, this is someone's back, right? So pain that extends from the spine downward to the front. So it's a loin pain. This is where the exact pain would be. So this is just hands, assuming. Okay, so this is called as a loin pain and a palpable mass because the kidney itself is quite palpable in most, of, like a lot of us, if we were to palpable and blot the kidney in a physical examination, we would be able to do it, especially after practice, like lots and lots of practice, you can palpate a normal kidney. So when we have an, uh, a mass or something forming in the kidney, it's quite palpable. So this is the main triad to look out for, hematuria, blood in the urine, loin pain, and a palpable mass. There are other presentations as well, obviously, that are um, that are more towards indicative towards a malignant cancer or tumor, not exactly to renal. It could be anywhere in the body. So it could be pyrexia, which basically means fever. It could be hypertension. Why hypertension? This is a very important question. Uh, we had an SAQ, I recall, from uh, this topic. So when we talk about hypertension, the reason hypertension is because um, we, the mass will end up compressing the renal vein. So when it compresses the renal vein, no matter what medication we give the patient to treat the hypertension, it will not work. Meaning the hypertension will not resolve. You can get any antihypertensive medication you give it to the patient and it will not resolve. So this is an indication that there's something wrong in the pathology itself. So when the mass compresses the renal vein, the hypertension is due to the renal vein itself, vein and artery itself being compressed. Okay. Now we have polycythemia. It can we can also have hypercalcemia due to the production of PTH-like hormone. This is not from the renal stem. It's from the metastasis that happens in the lung. Okay, so uh, that's why the hyperkalemia, uh, calcemia, sorry, hypercalcemia occurs as well. What is the investigation of choice that we use? The first, so there's two main ones that you have to answer. Uh, remember, if the question asks, what is the initial investigation? It is always the lesser uh, complicated one. It's always the lesser invasive one, the, the thing that is more feasible, that is lesser, uh, less expensive, etc. right? So the first one, the initial investigation will always be a renal ultrasound, okay? And sometimes uh, with experience, some doctors can even confirm it with a renal ultrasound. But what is a definitive diagnosis? definitive investigation for diagnosis, it's most likely a CT scan itself, all right? CT scan and biopsy is the definitive mode of investigation, whereas the initial investigation will be a renal ultrasound. Now, if a patient, we know that is the, through staging that the mass has spread out and it's gone outside the kidneys and it's already invading the inferior vena cava, etc., we must perform an echocardiogram to make sure it does not go and block the any of the arteries of arteries veins of the heart itself all right so that's very important here you can see this is an ultrasound you can see this is the uh, kidney this is the image of the kidney you can see the hyper intense sorry uh, you can see the image of the kidney here and then you can see the ivc and you can see that the ivc is actually filled it's it's not the, usually it would be black. It would be hollow and it would be black because blood would be flowing through. You can see an obstruction here. So in this case, the next step would be you do an echocardiogram to rule out anything else that would be impacting the heart. These are other images. This is a CT scan. You can see that the renal, uh, the, the kidney is not uniform on both sides. As a matter of fact, here you can see some growth that's happening outside as well. Here you can see the cortical region is not exactly right as well. Here as well, you can see some growth. So that's on imaging. Now, when we go to the staging, let's talk about staging now. When we talk about the T and staging, the T is for the type itself. 
N is for nodes, if there are any lymph nodes uh, involved, right? And M is for mets, metastasis, anywhere else. So when we look at T, this is a very uh, good image that can actually help you. So stage one is when it's it's less than seven centimeter and inside the kidney itself. Stage two is it's still inside the kidney, but it's more than seven centimeter. Stage three is when it's actually invading the veins and the adrenal gland. We all know that the adrenal gland sits right on top of the kidney itself. Stage four, sorry, that's stage three. And stage four it is when it goes beyond the fascia itself. And once it has lymph node involvement, we have the N. And once it goes way above the kidney, goes into the liver, into the lungs, brain, etc., we have the MEX itself, right? So N1 to 2 is the nodal involvement, and M1 is the distant metastasis itself. Renal carcinoma, the... Uh, the standard established care is radical nephrectomy. When we talk about uh, any form of surgery, we always go with two approaches. One is conservative, meaning we will try to save as much of the tissue, the original tissue, the organ itself. The other is the radical approach, which basically means we remove it all. The reason we remove it all is because we don't know um, what, it, what, not we don't know when there's a higher chance of recurrence we just go with removing it all because you don't want to subject the patient into constantly coming back for a follow-up constantly coming back uh to you know the fear of is it going to recur is it going to recur especially when you can just remove uh the thing itself right so the five-year survival rate with the radical nephrectomy uh, is, uh, if it was a stage one, it's 77%. If it's stage two, 62, and goes on downward. So as you can see, the higher the stage, the lesser the uh, five-year survival rate. This is because obviously once it goes out, it's harder to curtail the uh, tumor itself. Surgery is the curative treatment, period. That's it. This is what you need to know, and this is what's the most important thing, because um, when it comes to specific cancers, radio and chemo might help, but with renal, no, you just go with surgery. The option that shows surgery is the most correct one, and the objective is to excise most of the tumor or all of it, and uh, like I said, radical nephrectomy is actually the choice, and you leave a good surgery margin. Now, what if there was an early diagnosis? What if we actually diagnosed it early and we can actually just remove the tumor? So I'll show you guys what the treatment for that is in a bit. Again, the risk of post-operative recurrence also depends on the stage. As you can see, the recurrence rate increases as we go increase in stage. If it's just stage one, it's just 7%, which is minimal. As we go down, it increases up to even 40%, which is almost coming close to 50%, right? And the stage, even metastasis, it's not like it's decreasing. 23 is still a high percent compared to um, the other percentages overall. So um, again, continuing with the management, we just remember it goes surgical. This is a little bit over. You'll learn more about the approach and the types and the step-by-step -step in year four in your surgery rotation. For now, just understand that surgical option is the best. We, uh, we can either go through transabdominal, which is the front approach, or the loin incision, which is from the back. Most surgeons nowadays do prefer the back approach because they don't have to go through so many of the organs in the front. The renal vein will be ligated. When we say ligated, it basically means we clamp it, we close it, so that obviously we don't allow any tumor tissue uh, to go back into the blood flow, and also so that to decrease blood uh, loss, obviously. And the kidney and the adjacent tissues are also, uh, sorry, the adjacent tissues are also excised. So it's radical. We take as much as we can, and we leave just enough so that we don't have to like bother with like other things. So this is the approach. This is the uh, approach that we go from the loin. We uh, most right now, if this is what would happen in current day where it's mainly through um, laparoscopy. So we go through there and uh, that's the approach. 
do not go into the details of the techniques and the ways and the approaches. This is more of fourth year. In your stage, understand that in the clinical year, your, your main scheme should be the diagnosis, the investigation, the management. Know that these three, these three things and you're fine uh, for any topic, honestly. This is how it looks grossly. And uh, this is again a gross image of the same. This is the cytology. If we were to look it up under the microscope, another gross image. And uh, so some tumors, for example, especially breast, etc., they do a lymph node dissection, meaning they remove as many lymph nodes as they can to prevent the spread of the tumor. So however, for renal cell carcinoma, there's no proven benefit. So we don't really need to do it. Um, if there is a met only to like, let's say it went to the lungs and it's caught on very earlier on. And in the entire lung, there was only one metastasis. Then just excise that one metastasis. That's it. All right. So that's it. That should be fine. And occasionally this is done because again, we don't know what the imaging has not picked up. So there might be um, things that will just keep growing. So every time you see a solitary um metastasis it's not like we can actually go and resect it so we need to keep that in mind it's really surgeon to surgeon dependent radio and chemotherapy have no role this is very important because it's very important to understand when to not subject the patient to unnecessary treatment so radio and chemo have no role at all this is another ct image another ct image of the same Another approach that I uh, said I would talk about later on, remember when I said, what if we find it in stage one or stage two? There is another approach which is called the nephron sparing surgery. It's more conservative. It's not as harsh as the radical nephrectomy. It is more difficult and it requires a lot more expertise, et cetera, et cetera. What we do is we just remove the nephron itself, meaning that area of the kidney will be resected. How do we do it? It's an open laparotomy procedure. What we do is we make an incision, we open it up. It, you can do it laparoscopically, laparoscopically. So what you do is you open it up, you take the kidney out. You take the entire kidney out. This is the best way and the only way to approach it. You take the entire kidney out, you locate where exactly is the tumor, and then you ligate your renal artery, and sorry, renal vein, not the artery because that would lead to ischemia, uh, renal vein so that none of the tumor cells travel back into the bloodstream. And then this is very, very important. You have to cool the kidney for 20 minutes in an ice pack. Why? This is so that the kidney does not die off, right? So this maintains the temperature. This maintains, it makes sure that the kidney does not go into necrosis. And this is the exact way that they're ligating just in a nephron. I'm gonna try changing the color so that it's more visible. Just in a nephron, just the area so that the rest of the kidney is left behind. This is more tricky. This is harder. It requires a well exper an experienced surgeon. There is a chance that you know this doesn't work out. So it's important to explain to the patient all of it. Okay, so this is just the approach. They've taken the uh, a tumor out. They're suturing back. These are all sutures. Suturing it all back again. And this is for healing and reducing blood loss. There's a specific name for this uh, uh, coil. I forgot, unfortunately. But this is uh, put in place so that it decreases the blood loss as well as increases the uh, healing process. It, it's an absorbable uh, material, so it'll absorb by itself. And then a suture is put back inside. All right. It, there is a laparoscopy approach, but it's very, very hard and it's not really done uh, a lot of times. So um, like, okay, so here is how a uh, few times they actually do it. So they took, a, they took the, they had the study done and with uh, 179 patients, they had a survival rate of 92.5%, which is quite high and a recurrence of just 3.3%. And the follow-up they had was about two to three years. Okay, so the result is quite good, but there's a lot of complication. It has to be through an experiencedly, extremely experienced surgeon. And uh, also the stage really matters more than stage one, even for stage two, because it's more than seven centimeter. Some of the surgeons will just refuse to do it because there's no point. You might end up just resecting the whole kidney. So what's the point, right? So does anyone have any questions? We've come to the first checkpoint. We've finished the first type. And kind of like the trickiest one. So does anyone have any questions? And uh, can we please pause the recording?
does anyone have questions? All right, all clear. Thank you very much. So let's continue and go to the next one. The next one is bladder tumor pathology. So when we look at bladder, just going to write the full form, bladder tumor uh, in its own, we need to understand that this is the exact opposite of renal. We see a lot more uh, slow progressing benign forms itself. Well, not benign, but slower progressing ones, higher prognosis, better prognosis in general. So the classification of the bladder carcinomas is as follows. Most of them are transitional cell carcinomas, 5% are squamous cell, and 2% are adenocarcinomas. Adenocarcinomas have the worst prognosis while transitional cell carcinomas have the best prognosis. And this itself explains why bladder tumors in general have good um, prognosis on their own. So transitional cell carcinomas should be, okay, so sorry, transitional cell carcinomas, they are actually field changing, meaning they change from one type of cell to another. In a with varying type, levels of aggression, okay? It's not uniform. And 80% of them are well differentiated. Only 20% actually progress into muscle invasion. And they're usually associated, like I previously mentioned, with good prognosis. 20% of them are high grade and are extremely muscle invasive. These are not so good in terms of prognosis. And usually these will already have invasion at the time of presentation, meaning they're very fast to progress into the later stage of the disease. The main uh, risk factors or etiological factors that causes are some of the most common causes is occupational exposure. By occupational exposure, we mainly mean alanine dyes, chlorinated hydrocarbons, etc. Most countries around the world now do offer compensation for patients affected with bladder cancer, especially if it was, if it's proven that they do have an occupational hazard that caused it. 20% uh, of them are believed to be from occupational factors, which is actually quite high. Uh, smoking is one of the most, is one of the highest risk factors for um, bladder cancer as well. And of course, we have analgesic abuse, per pelvic irritation in terms of uh, you know, uh, carcinoma of the cervix, which is basically cervical cancer, uh, schistosoma hematobium, which causes an increase with the second most common type, which is the squamous cell carcinoma, all right? So how do they present? What is the most common type of presentation? And what is the most common word that is used in the STEMI for the MCQ point of view? It's hematuria. Mainly and specifically, painless hematuria. The patient will notice blood in their urine and it will be extremely, extremely painless. Like sometimes patients tend to ignore it. And um, so it's kind of like that. So the second thing is they have repeated infections, urinary tract infections. And even after multiple courses of treatment, it does not really, uh, there's no, it doesn't heal basically, right? And they have multiple, multiple, they go through it again and again and again, then they just think it's an infection or whatever, but it's actually the most common presentation. So if you see a STEMI with painless hematuria and uh, multiple uh, urinary tract infection, then it's a clear uh, indication of bladder cancer unless proven otherwise. What is the investigation we use? The first thing is urine analysis. This will actually show hematuria, meaning RBCs, even if there's no gross hematuria, meaning if we can't see it with our own eyes. Another initial investigation is ultrasound. Then we have the KUB to exclude any urinary tract calcification. And the most important one, and the definitive one that gives us the definitive diagnosis that we do have bladder cancer, that the patient does have bladder cancer, is flexible cystoscopy, right? After that, we also do urine cytology and uh, et cetera. But this is only after doing a flexible cystoscopy. So this is actually the definitive investigation uh, choice. This is how a flexible cystoscopy looks. We insert it through the ureter all the way to the bladder, and then we visualize it. When we visualize it, this is how it looks like. This is the bladder wall, and we can actually see the tumor growth. 
it's, it's a blurry picture, but you can actually still see it. This is how it looks like. And this is how a KUB looks like because we've inserted the dye. This is how, this is basically a picture of the wall of the bladder itself. As you can see, there's several, several layers that come to the wall. There's a fat, muscle, um, connective tissues, bladder lining, bladder wall, et cetera, et cetera. Why is it important to know these layers? It's basically, we're trying to figure out the stages of bladder cancer, right? This image is more easier to understand. We have stage zero, which is just in the lining. Usually we do not get to diagnose patients at this stage because there's no really, not a lot of symptoms that we can see. The second one is when it goes, stage one is when it goes into the connective layer. Right. Stage two is when it goes to the muscle. Stage three is when it goes into the local regional organs or into the pelvic lymph nodes. Stage five, uh, sorry, four is when it's actually gone way above and beyond to the major organs itself. Right. So this is something that you can see um, in situ. TIS is basically in situ. TA is these both come under T0. Right. Epithelium only. T1 is labna propria. T2 is superficial muscle, T3 is deep muscle, T3B is the fat invasion, T4 is prostate or pelvic organs otherwise, plus far away organs. All right, so this is how the staging itself looks. And the grade of the tumor basically depends on the cytology, meaning we take a biopsy and we see it through a microscope. And this is what determines the grade of the tumor, all right? So G1 means well differentiated. They have good prognosis. They will uh, progress very slowly. So we have a, the time frame that we have to treat the patient is a lot longer than compared to a T G3 where it's poorly differentiated. It's going to spread very fast and we need a faster approach as well, all right? G2 is moderately well differentiated is that's the thing. Now carcinoma in situ. So when we talk about carcinoma in situ, it's basically an aggressive disease. It's associated with a positive cytology. Uh, it, it, almost 50% of the patients have muscle invasion. Um, we can try other things. Uh, like we do try uh, with bladder cancer, we do try um, chemo and radio and everything, but we can also consider immunotherapy. And if nothing works at all, what we do is we just remove the whole bladder. We go for a cystectomy and we remove the whole bladder itself. While we change the urine, we'll talk about that in a bit. The other one, so if that was the approach to carcinoma in situ, when we talk about superficial, what we do is we go transurethral, like we do the cystoscopy, and we go and we just resect it, right? And we can also do a prophylactic chemotherapy if it's high grade so that we don't have recurrence. We can do immunotherapy. BCG is basically a vaccine that is given against the strain of mycobacterium bovis. What it does is that it prevents recurrence of the of bladder cancer itself because like i said we do have this can lead to squamous cell uh, can carcinoma right so we it kind of helps in preventing it and uh, we have a 50 to 70 percent response rate so it's fine it's it's a really high rate of response and um that's it so here you can see when you're looking at the ct you can see the carcinoma here this is the equipment we use you can see the lesion in the bladder. It's a very clear outgrowth when you through, see through the cystoscopy. And we can here you can see this instrument. It's basically hot wire. That's it. What it does is we're going to go and we scrape it with a good margin. So we just remove it. It's like scraping it off. It's basically cutting it off. Why is it heated? Because to prevent blood loss, right? So it basically burns that area off, takes off the bladder tumor, and we have, that's it, all right? So we go all the way deep so that we can prevent the um, recurrence. This is a video that I'm sure you can see through your PPT since I'm using the whiteboard, I can't play it. Now we go to invasive uh, transitional cell carcinoma, radical cystectomy, uh does have a side effect i mean sorry a uh, complication not side effect complication the mortality is five percent and for anything with a mortality of five percent is quite high so we do need to see pros with us versus uh con versus pros 
What we do is we remove the entire bladder, we take the urethra and we do a conduit, meaning we attach it usually through the ileum or we create a new bladder from the tissue of the colon itself. Mostly that nowadays we go with an individual conduit because it is the easier one. And recurrences is 15%. And uh, if we were to just treat the patient with radiotherapy, the recurrence would be 50%. So compared to that, we're actually decreasing the recurrence to a 15%. And preoperative radiotherapy is really not indicated. We can give chemotherapy along with it just to be sure. That's it, right? So what we do is we remove the entire bladder. We remove the entire bladder and we take the urethers and we attach it to the colon. And the colon has a bag-like structure. I mean, it has an uh, opening outside and it's attached to a bag. So each time the patient uh, urinates, the urine will go and collect in the bag and they have to throw, uh, throw the bag out and attach a new bag as you know, frequently as possible. So do we have any questions from here? Okay, we're going to move on to the, our third one, which is basically the prostate cancer. So far, we finished two main um, tumors. One was the renal, the other one is the bladder. So now we come to the third uh, genital urinary carcinoma, which is the prostate cancer. It is the most common malignancy of the male urogenital tract. The thing about prostate cancer is, as we know that beep, benign prostate hyperplasia is a very common problem that is in males uh, with, that increases with age, right? The symptoms of BPH and prostate cancer are quite similar. How they both present with painful, I mean, stress in, in uh, urination. Uh, they both present with incontinence, urgency, frequency, all of it. So it's very easy to actually miss out a diagnosis of prostate cancer until it's actually quite advanced. The second thing is age. Prostate cancer is something that is usually associated with elderly male. We're looking at the older population. So a lot of times, these this subset of population, they don't really complain of symptoms and it's easily missed out, right? That's why prostate cancer is found in the postmortem of postmortem of 50% of men rather than diagnosed before death itself, all right? So 5 to 10% of operations for BPH actually reveal prostate cancer. So this is the dilemma with prostate cancer. But the thing with prostate cancer is that it does not kill somebody, right? It can cause complications, but most people die with prostate cancer rather than of prostate cancer. So that's the thing about prostate cancer itself. All of these tumors are adenocarcinoma. They arise from the peripheral zone of the gland. They spread through the perineal spaces, bladder, neck, pelvic wall, rectum, etc. The more common approach is the lymphatic spread. Uh, the hematogenous spread does happen, but the more frequent one is the lymphatic one. It's graded by the Gleason classification. Just remember the name in case they ask you as an SAQ because these are the type of uh, short answers that they can ask. Remember, it's the Gleason classification. So majority of them nowadays are picked up by screening because we do screen for BPH using PSA. So we do have PSA, it's very simple. We just test for the serum. So it's, it's a very simple form of screening. 10%, we find them incidentally when we're doing a TUIP for BPH. The remainder, they'll present with bone pain and um, basically symptoms of leukoerythroblastic anemia, cord compression, meaning they'll say, oh, I can't feel my leg or like I can't move my leg because it's already metastasized to the uh, spine. And sometimes, what happens is that because of the increase in size, it will block both the ureters, which will lead to bilateral ureter ureteric obstruction. This leads to renal failure. So some patients can present with renal failure as well. The diagnosis basically is confirmed with a rectal examination. You, the feature is basically a hard nodule, but uh, the difference between this and a BPH is that it is irregular and the borders don't feel defined, 
right? And to confirm the diagnosis, we can do a transrectal biopsy. We can also use MRI to figure out the stage, and we can do a bone scan to know the presence of any metastasis because even though hematogenous spread is less common, it's not uh, unlikely, right? So, um, yeah, so, and we make sure we do a PSA level and a PSA of more than 10 is diagnostic as well. Now we do PSA, what a PSA is basically prostate specific antigen. They are produced by the prostatic epithelial cells. So when there is an increase in them, you already know that there is an increase in the epithelial cells, meaning the size of the prostate is growing. Okay, this is how we tie it up. So four is the upper limit of normal and four to 10 could indicate that it's growing or anything, but more than 10 is highly suggestive of prostatic cancer. And uh, we must go through the other screening methods like biopsy, et cetera, to rule it out, okay? And PSA is also used as a marker for following up to see if um, the treatment that we are uh, giving the patient is useful or not. This is a clear uh, picture for grading. There's another image that is more clear here. So stage one is basically we cannot feel it. We can do a physical examination, a rectal examination. We won't be able to feel it. Stage two, we can feel it. Like I said, it's an irregular, hard, nodule-like thing. Stage three, it's most likely spread to nearby tissues. Stage four, it could go to the organs itself, like tumor, like the bladder, etc. All right. So this is the staging. And this is how it spreads, right? Bladder, upward, behind, etc. Treatment is very subjective because a lot of times we do um, diagnose it in the elderly population. So sometimes it's just better not to treat it. Looking at pros and cons, symptomatic relief is preferred depending on this patient condition itself. It's not like the patient is dying from something far more serious and then you trying to treat this, which is not going to most likely not kill the patient. You're going to give a lot of inconvenience. So the treatment depends on stage of the disease, the age of the patient and gender fitness, right? There are other lots of treatment options for local disease. We go with observation. We see how the progression, we can go with a radical radiotherapy, which is less invasive or a prostatectomy, which is more invasive. If it's an advanced form, we do radical radiotherapy as well and hormone therapy, because at that point, it would be very hard to just remove the prostate because it could have spread away outside the prostate as well. If it's metastatic, we only do hormonal therapy. Why do we do hormonal? This is just a picture of how they do it. How, why we do we do, this is the radioactive, this is how they do radioactive therapy. They go through the rectum, they go all the way to the prostate, right? and they insert radioactive seeds. And these radioactive seeds are actually, this is how they look like. And they're in there doing their job, okay? So that's it. And then we induce radio frequency waves. And then these radio frequency waves are most likely, we're expecting it to kill the tumor itself. This is a bone scan. This is basically a bone scan. And we're seeing if there's any spread. And here you can see uh, that there is a uh, spread in the axial skeleton itself. Black means there's been spread, okay? So hormonal therapy, what do we mean by hormonal therapy? So it, most prostate cancers are actually androgen dependent, meaning the more amount of androgen they are exposed to, the more the prostate will grow, okay? So what we do is we try to remove this source of androgen. So hormonal therapy, what we're trying to do is decrease the production of androgen itself. Um, it's kind of a good form of palliative treatment. Palliative is usually end of life or like you towards the end where you just want the patient to be comfortable. No point treating a 90 year old with radical things and you know causing them more harm, etc. So what we do is androgen depletion. We do bilateral orchidectomy. Basically we take both of the testes out. So this decreases the production of um, androgen. We can do LHRH antagonists like gasoliraline, anti-androgens, and we can just block androgen itself. These are the main forms of hormonal therapy itself. Um, so this, with this, we complete the third tumor. So does anyone have any questions? Let's go to the next one. And the last one, and this is fairly very easy. So testicular tumors. 
Testicular tumors, they're the most common malignancy in young men. It's uh, by young, I mean very young. So uh, the peak incidence is between 25 to 35 years. So any, uh, there's actually a screening program where uh, young men are actually uh, advised and advocated to uh, have, uh, to palpate and to make sure that there's no changes or there's no pain. And uh, the most common presentation is a hard immobile testes. This is what the most common presentation is. So patients are uh, not just patients, the common, it's a screening program. So you, the patients are um, advocated to actually just screen themselves as well, even though it's not really uh, diagnostic, it's just for precaution itself. The highest incidence is Caucasian and then in Caucasian population. The peak incidence is 25 to 35 years. And okay, so the survival rate is actually 95%. There is very good prognosis when it comes to testicular cancer. But the thing is, once the diagnosis is made, th there is a speed in treatment because it could cause a lot more complications and far more uh, worse outcomes than just morbidity itself. The risk factors could be cryptorchidism, testicular maldescendant, meaning from childhood itself, it never descended, or Klinefelter syndrome uh, is also a major risk factor. The classification is divided into two, seminoma and non -sem It's actually non-seminoma, it's not none, it's non-seminoma. Basically, non-seminomas are made from germ cells, Right, germ cells are basically any cell that is uh, that can give uh, a rise to embryological tissue. So we have teratomas, yolk cell tumor, embryonal tumor, and mixed ger mixed germ cell tumor. So it's a 50-50. It can be this or that. The main investigation is testicular ultrasound and the pathological diagnosis, meaning biopsy. We can uh, it is confirmed by an inguinal orchidectomy meaning we remove the testes itself. The staging can be done through CT scan. The, a strong uh, marker to see how treatment to response and also for diagnosis is alpha fetal protein. Alpha fetal protein is increased in two conditions. One is in testicular cancer, other is hepatocellular carcinoma. So it's important to compare it and see the clinical presentation of how the patient is presenting. It's produced by the yolk cell elements. Uh, meaning in non-seminomas, we would see an increase in alpha fetal protein, but not so much in seminoma. We'd also see an elevation beta HCG, which is produced by the trophoblastic element, and also we can um, uh, see the LDH level as well. Stage definition, this is a very, uh, what do I say? It's a very concise way. The more proper staging is more detailed. I think... Personally, it is highly unlikely that they ask you of testicular uh, staging because it is quite complicated. But just to go through it, stage one, there's no evidence of metastasis. One, we have 1M, there's rising concentration of serum markers, but there's still no evidence of metastasis, meaning we have increase in beta HCG, alpha beta protein, etc. But we do not have evidence of meds. And stage two is basically, it goes to the abdominal nodes, to, so as you can see, it goes on and on and on. Is it important for your stage? Highly unlikely, but it is always good to just read through in case a question or two comes about it. This is how it looks like. As you can see here, they've done a bilateral orchidectomy where they've removed both the testes itself. Seminomas are radiosensitive, so we can treat it through uh, radiotherapy. Yep. And stage one and two are treated by inguinal orchidectomy plus radiotherapy. All right. So that this is so that it doesn't spread outside. But orchidectomy is still mainstay. Stage two, three are treated with chemo. Two, three and above are treated with chemotherapy. Non-seminoma, again, uh, non-seminoma are not radiosensitive, so we cannot use that. Treat, uh, stage one is treated with orchidectomy and surveillance, meaning we just see how does it progress. And it's more like we look at the scenario, the clinical presentation, et cetera, and the doctor decides we can go with chemotherapy, bleomycin, et cetera, uh, for patients who relapse from stage one. So stage one, you mainly go with orchidectomy and surveillance. And if we see a relapse, we go with chemotherapy. 
this is how a non seminoma looks like. So these are our questions. We're going to be quickly solving four questions before we end the session. And I'll just, uh, this is, um, so a 65 year old man presents with pancanaturia. All right. He's afebrile, meaning he does not have fever, has no other urinary symptoms, no trauma, no relevant medical history. He looks well. Urine cultures are negative. What is the single most appropriate investigation that le lead to the diagnosis? So what would we do here? Like, what would be the diagnosis? So like I said, we have frank hematuria and he has no other urinary symptoms and he has no history of trauma, but he's an elderly male, right? So the most appropriate investigation of choice here would be a cystoscopy so that we can rule out bladder cancer. Remember, it's you have to suspect it, especially in an elderly male, if they present with either hematuria or repeated urinary tract infections. And unless you do that, you cannot rule it out. All right. The second one is a 75 year old man has urinary symptoms of hesitancy, frequency, and nocturnia. A DRE relieves a large, irregular, hard, asymmetrical prostate gland. What is the single most investigation that will help with the diagnosis? So here you already know it's either one of two things because there's an in, 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 enlarged prostate gland. It's either BPH or prostate cancer. What's going to help you differentiate between the two is one very simple test, right? So it's the PSA and that's the test we look for. The third question is 77-year-old male, uh, African-American, comes with complaining of difficulty in passing urine. We already know that this is more indicative towards something with the prostate. He has a weak stream, so he's unable to completely empty, empty his bladder. So till here, your differentials are either prostate cancer or BPH because he's having difficult. he's an elderly male, he's having difficulty passing urine. Now comes the second bit where we go with lower back pain, lost 10 kgs, unintentional lacrima. And ultrasound shows bilateral hydronephrosis, which could actually mean renal failure, right? What could this mean? And hemoglobin is 10.5, which means anemia as well. CRP is elevated, meaning C-reactive protein is also elevated. So till here, you have the differential between BPH and prostate cancer. But when we look at symptoms like back pain, meaning the prostate cancer has metastasized to the spine itself, right? And unintentional weight loss, etc., we know that it is most likely bladder cancer itself. The last question we have is 57-year-old uh, male, chronic smoker, sorry, female, chronic smoker, reports three instances in the past two weeks, painless gross hematuria. So she an uh, intravenous urogram was done and it was reported as normal. She's been treated for irritative voiding symptoms, meaning she has a lot of urinary tract infection probably, uh, not febrile, meaning she has no fever, urine cultures are negative, meaning it's not a UTI, but she has some symptoms. And um, long-standing uh, incontinence made worse while coughing, urine dipstick shows hematuria. What is the single most appropriate, appropriate step? Everything here is pointing towards bladder cancer, right? The hematuria, urinary symptoms, irritative voiding, everything. So the most the thing that we need to do right now is flexible cystoscopy to rule it out. These are some of just clinches and pointers. Bladder cancer, what is the presentation? Plainless hematuria, voiding symptoms, most common type transitional cell carcinoma. All right, risk factors, smoking, occupational hazard, especially to aniline dye, investigation, cystoscopy of bladder and biopsy, second is urine cytology. The first differential for an elderly male or an elderly uh, for hematuria should be bladder cancer. For an elderly female, you can think of endometrial cancer, but that is vaginal bleeding. She can mistake it for hematuria because obviously she may have gone through menopause. But when you look at it, you must keep both in mind. All right. The second thing is prostate cancer, most common cancer in men. All right. Uh, the most common presentation is incomplete emptying, increased frequency and urgency, hematuria, weight loss and back pain. We saw this in our case. Mets, which can lead to bone pain, saddle anesthesia, etc. And the diagnosis is through a DRE, asymmetrical, irregular, hard and enlarged, enlarged prostate. Investigation is increased in PSA. A biopsy is definitive. And we do an MRI as well to see the staging. Management, if it's localized, we do a radical prostatectomy and radiotherapy. 
if it's already metastatic, no point really doing a prostatectomy. Uh, so we just go with radical radiotherapy and hormonal therapy, which is uh, androgen depreciation, deprivation therapy treatment. Last one, testicular cancer, painless and non-tender lump in the body of the testis. Can, the patient will palpate it themselves. It's not even a physical examination of the doctors. Most common is the patient themselves feel it. Testicular pain, metis to the bone, more than 95% are germ cell tumors. The risk factors is cryptochidism and Klinfelter syndrome. Investigation is ultrasound. You can do alpha feta protein and beta HCG. And uh, the testicular biopsy is not done because this is actually a very, very important point. You never, ever do a biopsy for the testes. Why? Because you can actually cause seeding. Seeding is basically when we do a biopsy and when we're removing the needle, the cells can travel through the bloodstream, through anything and cause mets. So you never do a biopsy for the testes. Management is radical orchidectomy and chemo therapy itself. That brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you very much. So if there's any questions, you feel free to ask me. Uh, the initial slide has my contact details. Of course, you feel free to email and um, text me as well if there's anything. And that brings us to the end of the session. We can stop the recording now, inshallah. Okay, thank you so, uh, very much. There was a question in the chat. I don't know if you answered it or not. For Hadid, yeah. she was asking, what is the difference between cryptochidism uh, uh, and testes male uh, descendant? So cryptochidism is basically when there is... Rot so wait, let's start with testes male rotation. Testes male rotation is basically when the testes do not descend into the, in, uh, into the scrotum itself. All right? Uh, this is uh, like from birth. And sometimes what we do is we do manually descend the uh, testes itself. All right. Uh, and testes, sorry, cryptochidism is when it's bilateral and the same condition happens. But the difference is that we don't actually cause the testes to descend manually either. So it's untreated. And we just leave it like that, okay? Both of them are basically the same. Cryptochidism is the medical terminology. Testes malute descendants is just how we say it in layman terms. But one is treated, one is not treated. That's it. Anytime. But both of them are risk factors. That's the main thing that you need to notice. And do we have Thank anything you. else? Uh, you I guys answered. Okay, thank you very much, Hadeel. You were answering questions. I couldn't really see the chat, but uh, good job. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye.